keep that. Keep that okay? I'm sorry. Absolutely. Thought that was his. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Well, it's so good to be back home in Laverne. I actually grew up here in this city and um, spent most of my childhood and some of my high school here. Uh, as a child, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior uh, at five years old. And I had a relatively good Christian upbringing uh, in this community. I actually went to this high school, Lutheran High Laverne. Is it still the Trojans? Go Trojans. Um, and it was a really fun time. In fact, when I was here in high school, my freshman year, I played football. And I was on the JV team. And that summer after that season, uh, all my friends uh, hit puberty and grew buff and big. And I kind of stayed the same size. <laughs> And so I actually ended up just going to wrestling and, and, and being on the wrestling team here. I had some very fond and wonderful memories being back. After I graduated here from Lutheran, I ended up going to Azusa Pacific University. I know there's some alum here, um, but certainly it was uh, during my freshman year in the spring, right around this time, I went on an outreach to Mexico. It was an outreach to help do VBS. It was an outreach just to care for people who needed some spiritual care. And it was a wonderful time. But it was when I got back that things really began to spiral out of control over a period of a few weeks. I remember uh, being on campus and I was studying in the library. They call it the Marshburn Library. And um, I, I began to see things that weren't there. I began to see things that weren't there. And so I left the library on a break, and I began to walk towards the men's dormitories. And uh, I did actually see some fire engines that were out in front of the men's dormitories. It's called Smith Hall. And I began to freak out because I saw a fire that was on top of the Smith Hall. And I began running around all campus. Oh, oh, uh, Smith Hall's on fire. We need to evacuate the campus. I ran into the library, uh, the library, and began to whisper to people, Smith Hall's on, on fire. Do you know that? We need to get out of here. But Smith Hall really wasn't on fire. And so people looked at me kind of funny, like, what's, what's going on with that man? And the people that knew me were like, oh, oh, that's David. I also began to hear voices, uh, voices that would begin speaking to me. And I remember actually taking an exam uh, and, and it was a midterm, and I was a little nervous, and I thought, okay, maybe this is a voice of God telling me uh, what answers to select. So these voices would tell me, uh, pick A, B, or C on multiple choice uh, answers, and, and I get to the, the exam. Uh, needless to say, uh, I did fail, fail that exam. A few weeks later, as things began to spiral out of control, um, I remember inviting all my wrestling buddies uh, from high school over to my parents' uh, house. My parents were on vacation, and we were just going to go swimming. We were going to watch a few movies and hang out. Uh, but uh, things began to get a little intense. I was upstairs, I remember, in my brother's room, and all my buddies were downstairs just, you know, messing around, watching TV or whatever. And my brother, uh, my younger brother in junior high, uh, was sitting with me, and I just said, hey, James, um, I got this idea. I think I'm supposed to take my life. I think somehow if I take my life, God would somehow be glorified. And my brother looked at me in horror, and he began to cry, because he could not make sense, you know, at a young age of what was going on with me. He just turned around and split and ran downstairs. He was gone. And I was, I was resolved to carry out my plan, and it was real simple. My plan was to go across the hallway from his room into the master bedroom, and in between the mattresses on my dad's and mom's bed was, uh, was a gun. It was a silver revolver, six bullets loaded, wrapped inside a lambskin sheath. I thought, that's my plan. I'm going to go do that right now because I want to be obedient. As I began to walk down the hallway, to carry out my plan, what was, in that sense, the best intention. Um, my friends ran up the stairs and intervened and tackled me on my way to carry out my plan upstairs, right in front of the bedroom door, the master bedroom door. And I struggled, and I fought. And there were about four of them, and they held me down, and they were all my wrestling buddies, and I was the smallest one, so they held me down. <laughs> and, they, and one of them said to me, you're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere, David. 
So they took the gun, they confiscated it, and they called the police. And the police came about 25, 30 minutes later, knocked on the door. And the police came, and my, my, my brother and the, my friend said, this is what happened. Um, you know, uh, and so the police began to interview David. Is that true? And I said, officer, I don't know what you're talking about. Everything's totally fine. I didn't want to take my life. And so the officer looked at me kind of funny, and, and he was with another individual. And as they were leaving the house, they figured there was nothing left to really, you know, investigate. And so I was getting ready to shunt the front door as they were turning around to leave. One of them actually turned around and faced me and said, David, are you, are you okay, David? Are, are you okay, really? Are you okay? And I looked at him dead in the eye and just said, officer, I'm just the Antichrist. I'm totally fine. He looked at me funny, and he turned around, and he walked away. You know, um, my sister, who was also going to Azusa Pacific University, arrived very, very soon. She was my older sister. She was a senior, and she came with her boyfriend, um, who is now her husband. Uh, and they came to the house, and, and they were figuring out, well, what happened? What's going on? And they were asking all these questions. And they saw that I was real skinny. Um, I hadn't been eating because I had been fasting for a week and a half or so, and not drinking very much. Uh, somehow in my religiosity, I had thought that that would help me in some way as I began to spiral down and descend into mental illness. And so they took me to the emergency room. And uh, this is actually where my dad used to work. He's a doctor as well. And um, him being out of town, they admitted me real quickly because they didn't think I was doing well. And as I lay there on the gurney, I was inside the little bay where you're kind of waiting to see what happens. They put an IV in my arm. And as I lay there, um, I was hearing hundreds of thousands of voices. They were just chanting in my brain. And I just lay there like, oh, what's going on? I can't handle this. And uh, a few hours later, my mom and dad arrived, and it was about 11 o'clock at night, and I was sitting there waiting uh, and, and to, to see what would happen next. And my, my mom got there, and all she could do was pray for me, just laid her hands and prayed for me quietly. And she prayed and prayed and prayed, and pretty soon I got this idea, this delusion as I'm looking back, that I was burning in hell, and I began to weep and scream out loud. It was so intense, and my mom was trying to calm me down. After about 15 minutes of calming me down, and they hung around for a bit, they admitted me, and they brought me into uh, some area where I could get some rest. They could monitor me with an IV. And, right around, and they went home. It was really late. And so right around 1.15 in the morning, I thought, oh, I'm Jesus now. I think my job is to go into the streets, and my job is to go out and begin to heal people. And so it was raining outside. I pulled the IV out of my arm. And the doctor goes, wait a second. And the nurse goes, where are you going? And I put my Ugg boots on and my shorts and my T-shirt. Um, and I just went outside. And I, and I began to run around the streets of Azusa, uh, pretty much homeless in the rain. And these voices were telling me, oh, go lay down on, right here in front of this supermarket uh, sidewalk. And it was raining. People would just literally drive by. And these voices, I was afraid I'd hear thunder. And this thunder somehow, in some way, was God's anger towards me and his wrath. And I was just freaking out. I, demons were after me, I thought. I'd hide behind trash cans and stuff. Right around 4 in the morning, my uncle found me, soaking wet, running around. And he took me to his house. And at the house were, were some police. And pretty soon, uh, I found myself being transported via ambulance uh, to an inpatient psychiatric facility, a locked psychiatric hospitals, where I stayed for about two weeks. Um, during that time, a lot of bizarre things happened with me, but I stabilized with some very heavily, uh, heavy doses of psychotropic medication. And then they discharged me. And I was, well, what's going on? It's, it's a little past spring now. I, I certainly didn't go back to APU. Uh, for that spring semester, uh, but months later, having seen a psychiatrist, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And that summer, um, as I struggled, I thought, okay, I'm going to start new. I'm going to find a poster for my room, and I'm going to, like, decorate. And I ran across a famous painting. It's called The Scream. Some of you might have seen this. 
And I found that painting, and I thought, this describes my life. Someone out there actually understands what it feels like to feel this turmoil and to feel this pain and to walk through these irrational beliefs that I didn't know at that time I was experiencing, to see things and to hear things that were not there. And so it was very kind of catalyzing for me in my spirit, like, whoa, okay, that's like a form of empathy. So I hung that on my wall uh, as a source of comfort. I had about six relapses over the next seven years. And, you know, people often ask me how I've bounced back. In other words, they ask me, how did you temper the storm? How did you end up having a successful career uh, for the next 20 plus years uh, in different leadership positions, um, nonprofit executive and and things like that? And, And what they're really asking me In other words, what they're really saying is what helps build resilience when there is suffering and when there is pain? So I'm going to share with you three resilience strategies that will help you grow in your spiritual wellness and well-being so that you can temper the storms of life when they come. The first resilience strategy is to build community. It's to build community. And before I get into some tips about doing so, um, I want to talk about the research. Uh, Dr. Axine did a great job in talking about relationships and teamwork and connection. There's a lot of studies out there um, that focus on the, the, the correlation between resilience and, and being connected. But first of all, what I often see in my practice, what I often see at the church, at Saddleback Church and in my career, Uh, people who are isolated and disconnected is is this kind of fear discourse, this fear that comes up uh, that says, my my pain, I got to keep it hidden. Um, Or else maybe people, uh, if they find out about my pain, I'll be put to shame. Or perhaps um, I might be judged. Uh, I shouldn't tell anyone. Or perhaps uh, what keeps you from getting connected and building community is that you've been hurt by others. You've been hurt by others. Some of us have been extremely hurt even by the church. And so once we understand what that barrier is to building community, then we could overcome that. And so here's a couple steps I want to give you on building community, real simple. Uh, Number one, uh, become vulnerable. And that requires a choice, a decision. Uh, In other words, just put your guard down. Put your guard down. It's a willing choice. And I acknowledge some of the pain. Uh, for some of us that are here. The second thing is you want to take risks in building community. You want to be willing to take risks, even a small risk to become vulnerable and become known. Studies also show that when you become vulnerable, they have the highest quality types of relationships, actually, that lead to wellness and uh, leads to satisfaction. And the third thing is you also want to make a commitment. You want to be intentional. Make a commitment to building community. See, uh, I've been hurt by the church. Um, Part of my story is I went to actually six churches looking for help, and I didn't get any help when I wasn't doing well. Um, But you you got to understand the church is not perfect, and we are all broken people. So there's lots of grace uh, for each of us. So some of the ways as a man you can get involved in community, and I'll share also how we can get our children in community to build resilience, build connection, is go on a missions trip. Go on a missions trip, a short-term missions trip, um, or maybe you could join a small group. Many of our churches here have different types. They call them Bible studies sometimes. Um, You can get involved in a men's study, if there's a men's study happening for a 12-week session. Um, One thing I'd really encourage you is maybe uh, celebrate recovery. Uh, Celebrate Recovery, for those of you that don't know, is um, a type of support group that you can get involved in that's Christ-centered. It's like a Christian 12-step. If you're struggling with an addiction, a hurt, a hang-up, or a habit, um, we're in about 30,000 churches across the world. Just go to CelebrateRecovery.com and uh, type in your zip code, and you'll find a number of churches that might be doing that here even in this community. Become vulnerable, take a risk, and get involved make a commitment. Uh, a couple real quick ones, join a mountain bike club. If you love the mountain bike, I saw Dr. Axine's slide on mountain, cl- uh, mountain biking uh, camp with other families. There's many, many ways in which you could begin to be intentional and begin to build community because when 
the storm comes, you're going to need each other. Do this with your kids too. Uh, get them involved in youth group. If you have children, get them involved in a sport, uh, Boy Scouts. Uh, one of the favorite things that uh, I love to do is take my kids to the beach with all their friends and have a campfire at night. It's not very expensive. Um, you know, you just pay for a bunch of hot dogs and five bucks for a bunch of logs, and you're fine uh, when you go to the local beach. You could have holiday parties, Fourth uh, of July, you could birthday. Find a reason to get together as 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 uh, as a way to build community around yourself and around your family, your children. Ecclesiastes 4:12 says this, and this is from the message. It says this: By yourself, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? A three-stranded rope isn't easily snapped. You know, the second resilience strategy is to strengthen your relationships. Strengthen your relationships. And one of the most common things that I've seen as a barrier to people strengthening relationships is that they'll say this uh, kind of uh, in their mind, or uh, this, they call it self-talk in, in psychology, you say this to yourself, this is my battle, uh, this is my fight, and, and I should go it alone. Um, in a culture like in our U.S. today, independence is a big value. The culture of independence oftentimes leads to a sense of isolation for a lot of men. Um, you end up getting disconnected and really kind of think of a refrigerator with a plug, um, and you're just not plugged in, so the power's off, and it just leads to isolationism and loneliness and a lot of different things. But I'm going to share with you three areas you really want to strengthen your relationships. Uh, this is very important. I see this time and time again uh, throughout the, the career that I've had. Uh, first, you want to strengthen your relationship with God. Then you want to strengthen your relationship with others. And third, you want to strengthen your relationship and how you relate to yourself. So let me pose a question uh, that might help us take this next step. The question is real simple. What if anything stands in the way of intimacy between me and God? You can ask yourself that. What stands in the way of intimacy between me and others? And how do I relate to myself? We're talking to ourselves all the time. Uh, there are studies that show there are thousands of thoughts that come to our mind and how we talk to ourselves, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what I've seen as a, you know, as a licensed therapist by training, um, I've seen people have a lot of trouble in how they relate and connect with God in particular. Uh, one of the most common things is that I've seen is that we bring our childhood views of our parents, especially of our dad, into our relationship with God. And so for me, I thought God was really angry. Where do you think that, that view came from? So God, you know, in my healing and my growth, I begin to recognize God is not angry at me. He's not angry at you. He's for you. He accepts you. He pursues you. He, you can be trusted. And for me, performance of wanting to be loved by God had to be sacrificed. And I'm sure there's many here where you needing to perform to get love. And so it's no longer needed. It's no longer needed. The Bible says that God loves you unconditionally. And if you have fallen down in some way, he wants to pick you up so that you can continue running the race. And I want to acknowledge that we cannot be perfect. We struggle, right? We're not perfect. Uh, very commonly asked of me at Saddleback Church is, you know, I just can't make the mark. Well, uh, guess what? Don't come to this church if you're perfect because you're going to ruin it. <laughs> Because we're all broken. And so there's this kind of humanity we got to acknowledge uh, that is there. Also, what stands in the way of intimacy with others. And here's what I would say would help build resilience and strengthening relationship. It's reconciliation. Reconciliation is key. Like I said, because we are broken, we will have conflict. So how do we reconcile? And reconciling really is the coming together of two people to make the relationship right. And so let me give you an illustration. Uh, this is myself or you, and this is the other person uh, that you're in conflict with. And so the question is, when you're in conflict, are you mad at each other? Should we take each other out? Should we debate each other until we're right? How do we make this relationship right? And picture, actually, 
um, boulders, if you would, that represent the issues in that relationship that you're having a tough time with. It could be finances. It could be how you raise your children. It could be maybe some type of way that you relate in your communication. Whatever it is, picture these boulders that are there. And your job to, is not to take each other out. When you come together, your job is to move these boulders out of the way so you could have an increased intimacy and connection. And sometimes you're going to need to agree to disagree. And third, how do you relate to yourself? And personally, um, I have struggled with guilt and shame, and I've seen a lot of men struggle with guilt and shame. And the question that comes up is, how long should we feel guilt and shame uh, uh, when it begins to come? It's a natural feeling. I would say just a few seconds. A few seconds, just long enough to confess it before Jesus in which you are instantly forgiven. The hard part for all of us, and most often, is making the choice to forgive oneself uh, because you might think or tell yourself, maybe I don't deserve it. Or maybe you did have that father figure who treated you very critically, and so you're kind of looking through that lens at yourself critically. And so the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, 1, here's the NIV version, there is, no, now, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so some of the best things that you can do is to let yourself off the hook. Christ has already forgiven you. So you can be kind and learn to be compassionate even to yourself. You can forgive yourself. And if you're asking for the biblical support for this, the Bible says this, love your neighbor as yourself. And so there's a healthy kind of spirituality that comes in how you care for yourself with rest, but also how you care for yourself and talk to yourself uh, too, you know. I remember um, as I grew up, I didn't have a very great childhood uh, per se. I mean, there were some great things that happened, but most of my childhood was growing up with, a, with an angry dad. And uh, he was distant and critical. And I, in my college years, very much thought that God was distant and critical, that he was far away and somehow uh, was not uh, interested in being intimate with someone like me because I was just so sinful. And, and noted, my dad is different today. He's very much healthy in how I relate to him, but I just could not forgive him. I was just so angry um, uh, in counseling. I went to counseling for 10 years, and I just could not come to that place of forgiveness until I had this epiphany. Dad suffered at the hands of Grandpa. And I began to remember stories of how my dad was not treated very well by, in Filipino, they call it Lolo, Grandpa, was not treated well by Lolo at all. And as God took in this process of forgiveness, I remember, uh, I began to remember how good God was to me. In this process of forgiveness, I, I began to remember how good it felt to be forgiven. And in that, I began to have compassion for my dad. It did not excuse, it did not excuse uh, what went on in the home and how I grew up. But I was finally able to accept the pain that he gave me. And I was also able then to give him forgiveness. See the paradigm here, guys? Understanding, remembering your own forgiveness, uh, having compassion, accepting that pain, and choosing to give that gift of forgiveness. Makes it much easier when you begin to see through the lens of how Christ might see that pain in the other person. And so what's the motivator of strengthening relationships? What is it that really moves us into wanting to really build this resilience? And it can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy. It does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, we just learned about that. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. So let's let love strengthen our relationships with God and with others, and even how we relate to ourselves. You know, the third resilience strategy, and this is really key, I think, um, this one's very important, is, is to cultivate hope. 
is to cultivate hope in our lives. And there are two ways we can cultivate hope um, that I can share with you this, this afternoon. The first part is to be expectant of God. In other words, um, have expectant faith. What do you expect of God? And let me explain this in another way uh, to look at it. Um, let the size of your God be the size of your faith. You know, oftentimes there's this kind of tension between faith and control that we have in us. Uh, it seems as though the more faith we have, the less control we need to have. But the more control we have, the less faith we kind of see that coming down on the scale. So what's the outcome when you do have faith? What's the outcome when you begin to place God in the driver's seat? And what you're going to see here is an increase in resilience when you begin to move in that way. But the second part of cultivating hope, which is a sister uh, of this, is, is uh, surrender. Is surrender. And this is a daily surrendering. I remember uh, I was going through one of my relapses at, uh, at my dormitory room. They call them the mods, uh, the modulars. They're like two-bedroom apartments at APU. And it was a Friday night. And I remember my roommates had gone out and they were out at the movies or doing whatever. I was isolated and the light was off in, the, in my mod. And again, it was raining outside. And I was looking out into the empty parking lot, completely feeling isolated. And I saw the little yellow lights, the parking lot lights, and there was turmoil in my soul because I was going through a relapse. I was having such an incredible, difficult time. And finally, I just thought, I did stop taking my medicine, by the way. I finally just thought, you know what? I've been through the ringer these last seasons of life, and all I know is that, God, you're the one that can get me out of this. The only, and I said this to him as I cried out to him. God, you're the only one in the whole universe that can get me out of this. I just, I just and I got on my knees, I said, Lord, I need your help. This is it. I surrender. And it was a peace that kind of came into that place. And actually, things began to change um, at, at my time at APU after that night. You know, what God wants to know is this. Do you trust me? When the suffering and pain comes, do you trust me? Do you trust me with your finances? With what I have to say in my word about relationships and career? Do you trust me with your, with your future? Do you trust me with your reputation or even your business? See, when you're expectant and when you surrender, you're going to find that your suffering and pain bring hope. And God never wastes a hurt. Romans chapter 5 says this, And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. In closing, I would like to pray for you and then share a few words afterwards. Uh, would you please bow your heads? Thank you. I think that um, some of us need hope today and are having a tough time. Some of us are isolated and uh, need to be in community. And some of us maybe need to reconcile with a friend or a loved one. Maybe the Holy Spirit might be bringing some thoughts in your mind in this area. And I'm glad because you've come to the right place today. And I'd love to pray for you and over you in these areas. So let us pray.